Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I'm Justin Gunther, the director of Falling Water, and you're here for our inaugural <coughs> Falling Water Fireside Conversation. Um, the Kaufmans would bring people together here in the living room to advance discussions around art, architecture, nature. So you're in a space where the likes of Albert Einstein, Frida Kahlo, the Spire family, um, Henry Russell Hitchcock, the great architectural historian, Alfred Barr, the MoMA director, would come here for conversations with the Kaufman family. So we're carrying on that tradition uh, with this series of conversations. And our first guest uh, is Brian Hunt. Brian is an award-winning sculptor with work in close to 50 museums mm, more or less. around there. Yeah. Uh, the Guggenheim, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, LACMA, LACMA. Um, the Whitney Metropolitan Museum, just a few All modest the museums, museums. In New York. <laughs> yeah. and beyond abroad as well. <laughs> Um, he was born in, I'm going to mispronounce your hometown, Terre Haute, Terre Haute, Terre Haute Indiana, Indiana. Um, and then moved around to Florida and other places as a young man, mm -hmm. um, but then found his way to Los Angeles where he went to the Otis um, Art Institute, mm -hmm. um, and then you did a residency at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Whitney Independent, Independent Study, Study Program. Program. Um, and throughout his career, he's received many accolades and awards. I'm just going to name a few of them. A grand prize in 1991 for the International Arts Festival in Seoul, South Korea. A Design and Excellence Award in 2006 from the Mayor of New York City. Um, a Fine Arts Award in 2007 from the American Academy of Arts and Letters in New York. So you're, we're in good company tonight. And what brings him here um, is an encounter with Edgar Kaufman Jr. Um, Edgar Kaufman Jr. encountered uh, Brian Hunt's mm -hmm. work at the Guggenheim at a Young Artist exhibition in 1978. 78, yes. Um, and the Kaufmans had lost a sculpture at the bridge due to a flood in the 1950s. Um, so Kaufman knew the spot, he wanted a replacement, and he knew the artist that he wanted to replace the work. Um, and that brought Brian Hunt to Falling Water. So we're going to hear about that story, hear about your impressions of Edgar Kaufman Jr. But first, let's hear a little bit about your, where you came from, why you're an artist, growing Ooh. up in Indiana as a child. <laughs> <laughs> but, th but this gentleman worked at NASA, at the Kennedy Space Center. At Kennedy Space Center, so Apollo how do you, program. So how do you go from the Apollo program as a young man in, uh, in your 20s it to a career in fine yeah. art. I actually I was always thinking of myself as an artist. A, as a child, I think I found uh, my inner place. I was protected of my talent of drawing and. Um, but I didn't know what an artist really was. I just felt like art and architecture was the place that I could exist and be and I uh, kind of started out that way. Um, I guess in Indiana what you're doing is you're as a child you're kind of looking at cornfields and almost nothingness. There was a Swiss dealer named Byler who wanted to do a show of, of uh, Indiana sculptors, which is John Chamberlain, Bruce Nauman, David Smith. It was just like this incredible group of sculptors and it just kind of makes you think of out of this kind of flat land yeah. that these, this kind of three-dimensional um, idea or in involvement came about. But anyway, I like to build models. And, uh, you know. But I had this, I was a Tomorrowland kind of kid mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. I was always thinking futuristically or science fiction-ly. And uh, I had the opportunity to, I was studying at University of South Florida and I didn't get drafted to go to Vietnam. I had a medical 
uh, thing. And uh, I was loose, I was freed. I didn't have to go to university at that moment. I just thought, you know, 90 miles away from Tampa, Florida, where I, was, where I grew up, is uh, Kennedy Space Center. And, you know, as a child, we'd go watch the rockets, you know, just a little beam of light going up into the sky. And so I, I drove there uh, and I got a job immediately uh, for Grumman Aircraft that was um, responsible for the lunar module. And uh, everybody was from Long Island. They're from Bethpage. I'd never met uh, New Yorkers or anything. There's all of a sudden there's a room. Were you confused by the accent? Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but actually, you know, so friendly. And anyway, we just uh, kind of, I was like a gopher in Hollywood. They'd say, hey, kid, you know, go up to pad 37 and take a reading on this. And it was like the best job in the world. And at the same time, I was living in Cocoa Beach and I uh, was painting in the kitchen and, th you know, entering little sidewalk art fairs, so. And surfing. Did and surfing. Surf? Yeah. So it was just kind of like, check, check, check. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, it went on from there and then I decided it's time to go to art school. That's what my, um, dream is to be an artist and I went to uh, Los Angeles. I was accepted at Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles and um, I went there for two years until I went to New York for the with the Whitney program and it just it seems like everything just kept unfolding and time was elastic that it just seemed like oh yeah of course I'm going you know, I'm going to New York, and it's just all these, it was pretty incredible. How did you find out about the Whitney program? I had an instructor named Miles Forrest, and he said, you know, and he was a New Yorker, and he was an artist, conceptual artist, and a jazz musician, and he, he just said, you know what, I think you should just go to, there's this program in New York, you're, you're, you're good for New York, you should, just apply for this thing, I'll yeah. write a little thing, and it changed my life. One person just wrote that went out of their way to say that to me, and um, I followed through, and it was really one of the best things I ever did was to go to New York and to be in the Whitney program, and there were seminars with you know, Richard Serra or Philip Glass, or I mean, it was just, this kind of wellspring of information and excitement and openings and what was your work like at, in that program what were you doing at that time I was a little bit all over the place I was kind of like a conceptual but I wanted materials I mean right in that period 72 it was anti-material really it was more um, conceptual art, so it was more photographs and more explanation of that, and then more performance. And um, so I was making these light things that are forgettable. <laughs> 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 totally. Got to start somewhere. Uh, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and that was, yeah, it was really about being around people students from all over the country. Uh, Catherine Bigelow was in my class. She was a good painter. And uh, she went on to become this wonderful director. And Julian Schnabel was there. I mean, it was just like this, uh, um, and everybody was, you know, late 20s, mid 20s. Um, so it was cafe society kind yeah. of go to yeah. Finelli's um. so you earlier in your career you you had an interest in architecture that you were expressing right you were yeah. doing models of landmark buildings and yeah can you talk about what inspired you to do that and did you ever want to 
be an architect? Did you ever? You know, I, to be quite honest, I didn't know artists could make a living. I thought, that's a good thing, but I'm, I would like to, I was entertaining the idea, what do I do with my life? And I thought an architect is kind of functioning in, in a way an artist does, um, but with, you know, building architecture. So I always thought of uh, Howard Rourke and what's the Fountainhead? The Fountainhead. Fountain <laughs> read that. Like, boom. Um, and there was this parallel of being at NASA. I was, the thing about working at NASA was there was beauty, but it wasn't intentional beauty. It was huh. functional. Uh -huh. And every the gantries or the, the mechanics of these incredible spaceships were just like you're looking at something and you know that nobody's saying like, well, can't you like make it a little, you know, curve into it or make it a, it was just all this kind of direct um, experience of what I guess the architect, the purity of architecture was in that engineering. The functionality. The functionality. And, the functionality. and then you oh. found sculpture to be a, even though you were sculpting buildings, mm -hmm. like the Great Wall of China, Hoover Dam, Empire State yeah. Building. Oh, that's when were, I was going conceptual, yeah. and I was impressed, so impressed by the earthwork artists like Smith and Heiser, um, Sarah, he wasn't an earthwork, but he was in injecting his steel plates into earth environment. And I th I'm this next generation, so I'm kind of using that Im their information of earthwork and looking at projects out in the desert. I mean, the spiral jetty to me was one of the yeah. great all-time artworks, still is. Um, and I thought, how can, how would I interpret this? And I was thinking, well, first, I will address Christo <laughs> and <laughs> um, Valley Curtain or Running Fence or these things. And instead of making, going out and raising the money and doing these huge productions, I would just study the Wall of China. The the dimensions, the topography that it, the mountain scape that it went over, and I have since been to these uh, Nankow Pass, and I made this a bronze, my first bronze. I worked for a foundry to pay for the my first bronze, <laughs> and uh, I just felt like this is me. This is I. I own this. This is. The Wall of China is my conceptual art piece, yeah. and I hung it on the wall. And what was interesting is all the mythology and the Borgesian kind of connections to meaning. Um, to me, the stations over Nan Nankow Pass, the, uh, I forget what they're called, the fort fortresses, were like a Judd box. Judd boxes on a landscape. So this is what was f fulfilling me at the time. Yeah, yeah. And then the Hoover Dam, I thought, well, this is another way of addressing Christo. Is, um, you can do it bigger, but I can make <laughs> it weirder. <laughs> you know, I always thought it would be amazing if Christo had draped this house. Oh, Wouldn't that have been? Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> But you can't uh, ask them for a commission. They have to, it has to come to them. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, well, did, did you grow up with an in interest? I mean, a household name, Frank Lloyd Wright was a household name. Did you grow up with an interest in him or know of him as a child? I, I did. I had yeah. to. It was, my information was uh, Look Magazine, Life Magazine, Newsweek. My parents would have all that information and some books, but um, Frank Lloyd Wright was kind of iconic when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. I would just go, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright. It was just uh, 
rock solid architect, um, creator, yeah. um, kind of social thinker. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So tell me, <laughs> tell me about. So Junior sees your work um. at the Guggenheim. How did he find you? How did he? Did he just call you up? Did he? How did he track you down? How did he yeah, know that? No Google. No I Google. I couldn't look him up. <laughs> he couldn't look me up. Yeah, you know, it's and amazing. did you know who Edgar Kaufman no. Jr. was? No. I when did. you got a phone call out of the blue from him? No. I yeah. he, and he said, hello, uh, hello, uh, this is Edgar Kaufman Jr. And I went, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm busy. Um, uh, I was kind of getting everything ready to go to California to work because I had a s studio still in California. I was and you would drive cross country between yeah. New York and California yeah. still, yeah. Eight times. Wow. Um, <laughs> anyway, I was in this uh, amazing moment in my career that I was just in a Whitney biannual. Um, I was in this show after the Whitney biannual. Uh, Guggenheim had a show, it's called uh, Young American Artist, and there were 10 of us, uh, Martin Purrier and Scott Burden, and I wow. mean, some really yeah. accomplished people. And so Edgar saw my work. I, Martin Purrier and I got the high gallery at the Guggenheim, so I had, I guess, how, I would, how would I get to the waterfalls from the dam to the lakes, I went from the dam to the lakes. I was like wanting to take a lake out of its earth mold, like Brancusi took, made a cup yeah. out of wood and used it as an object and it was just like this flat. And you know, what you're doing is you're just translating information that you're picking up and how do I, how would I see that as myself, as a Brancusi cup? And I was thinking a lake is like that cup. So I made a series of lakes for a couple of years and quarries. And then um, I was thinking, well that, the lakes are like these sleeping forms, reclining figures in a way. And what is next would be a standing figure. Yeah. And then came my waterfalls. The waterfalls just gave me license to interpret anything. Um, so did you start thinking they would be abstracted figures or were you taking the water in the other way around? I was turning them into Turning them into yeah, what? figure figural representations. It wasn't as my. It was almost like Ansel Adams in Yosemite, just going to a waterfall and just getting that exact angle. Yeah, that's so lively and uh, singular. So I'm basically the waterfall to me was the figure in the landscape, um, not a figurative figure, but nature. Water is life. I mean, it just filled all these things. And I'm going through the spectrum of art history. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is good. You know, nobody's been here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's kind of like what Giacometti did when he found that he's just going to take a figure and the zeitgeist or the compression of his moment and Europe in that moment, and his way of articulating the surface was, I wanted to kind of have that relationship with my work, but the water was flowing, and um, it was kind of like this poetry between the beginning and the end. Um, and yes, that's how. Well, it is a little incongruous to think of taking, taking something that's always moving Yes. And then turning it into something that's frozen and solid, yet there's yes. still motion in your pieces. Yes. But you know, you, you're freezing the molten metal into bronze and you're taking that expression of movement and turning it into something solid. 
That's what you think about yeah, when that's you're what you a think sculptor. Yeah. You're thinking like, this is what I'm doing, and how do I do it? And what, how am I going to address this? How can I make this um, step up to a, a level that kind of balances out as, oh, I'm encountering a sculpture that is this almost like a brush stroke of nature and uh, you know, communicating, you know, you take what you see with you, I guess. Did, did Junior have a, Edgar Kaufman Jr. have a comment on what he liked about these waterfall sculptures? Well, so he uh, calls me and he said, I have Edgar Kaufman, I'd like to come to your studio if you have some time. And I said, well, I have a couple days before I leave, you know, like, had I known, I would have said, jeez. <laughs> 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 um, and he said, good. And then he said, are you on a walk up? And I was in a little carriage house on Great Jones Street. And it's a third floor, this old carriage house that I renovated. I had to do all the work myself, but funky. Um, well, he would have appreciated that, I'm sure. I think yeah. he did. Yeah. I think yeah. he did. He kind of yeah. walked in with a big smile on his face. <laughs> yeah. And um and I'm going like, "Wow, you're you're a little old and you're just <laughs> you so have no idea who this guy so, is." Yeah. I mean, he was just his presence was yeah. this esthete kind of and he's just high and he goes over to my drawing table and he he says, "Well, I have this project that I when I saw your work at the Guggenheim, I think that you might be interested. And I'm going like, okay. <laughs> and so he has his man manila envelope. I've told this story to over and over. It probably kind of gets more mythological. <laughs> 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 sometimes I fall on the floor, sometimes <laughs> I do that. Um, he has this envelope and he says, well, here's, here's what I'm, I'm thinking at first I'd like to show you the house and he just pulls out this photo of falling water and I'm going <laughs> 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 and I just pointed you this and he says yes you you <laughs> <laughs> it was hysterical and I'm going I what and he says yes I would like for you to go to falling water I have a site that uh, might work for you. I'd like for you to spend a little time. And I was just uh, beside myself um, that this was something that I could not imagine. I mean, that being in those shows at different museums is one thing, but to have this um, opportunity. Did he come with you or did he just Ask, tell you to come to Falling Water and he spend said a few just days. Yeah, it yeah. Because I didn't have much time, I w came here immediately, drove here, and then drove back to the city, and then we talked. And he invited me um, uptown to Park Avenue, um, and I I got to know him a little bit better by his the interior of his place. And wow, it was. You know, it's the kind of thing where, and I was saying earlier, you go into these great collections um, and you just want to memorize everything <laughs> that you see. Um, and it was like Paul Clay and there was a, a right table and there were, we were talking about uh, scholar's rocks, Chinese scholar's rocks and um, and a Monet and a Kooning and a de Kooning Picasso and this Rodin, Rodin. The, uh, the craziest, most amazing Rodin we will ever see. Which used um, to be here at Falling Water at the yeah, guest house I pool. I did not know yeah. that. At the yeah. pool. Uh -huh. um, and I was just the elegance and the austerity of the moment. Um, was so, so, and he was so open to me, I was kind of like rambunctious in a way. Um, but yeah, very, very, very memorable. 
So what were your impressions that first time you came to the house and saw the... Because the, the location was predetermined. That yes. was your one constraint. Right? Yes. And then you had free reign of the house and the landscape. Yes, I got to spend time here when it was closed. And I mean, th it was just incredible. I came here a few times, came in the autumn. Um, I knew that what I ended up doing, I wanted something kind of quiet in a way, singular in a way, not a, a waterfall that's a bit figurative, but it's elevational too, mm -hmm. like the top of the waterfall, my bare run piece is kind of equated to the horizontals of the house. Mm. And uh, nothing loud, I just wanted it to not occupy or interrupt this moment when everybody just walks up to this glorious uh, architecture. It's a far cry from the Marino Marini sculpture that was there. It sat on the wall oh there. It did. I yeah. Thought it sat where the, uh, yeah. The other one was. No, yeah, it sat there and the, yeah. So, but yeah. a far, a far, far cry, cry from. I mean, from much that quieter sculpture. than that, right? <laughs> way, way quieter. Yes. It's phallic. Yes, much less phallic. <laughs> well, I guess you can well, interpret. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> so you had free reign of the house. Falling water can be a daunting backdrop for an artist. Mm -hmm. it, you know, you had other great works of sculpture on mm -hmm. the grounds as well. Jacques Lipschitz just down at the pool. Mm -hmm. Peter Volkos up at the other pool. Yeah, yeah. Richmond Barté, Mardonia Magana scattered throughout the landscape here too. Yes. Were they informing you in any way on what you were going to do? Were you intimidated at all by mm -hmm. the architecture? I just felt, no, I, I felt inspired. Yeah. I just felt like this is a moment to thrive. And, and um, I made lots of drawings. I actually recently went back and found the sketchbook that the notes I was keeping from this experience. And the, I was taking hundreds of SX-70s at the time. So I have, you've seen a, yeah. a few of them. Yeah. And I did take regular photos, but just the notes I was taking about the, the nature of how the, the harmony of this home and uh, the inspiration. Um, I'm, you know, I'm always interested in process too about how something like this comes into being. Can you speak about how you created that work a little bit? Talk to us about that. What's your process for actually creating the creating sculpture? It. Yeah. So I uh, went out to California and I had a mission, you know, that I was worried. It, what a good feeling, right? Just having a commission at Falling Water <laughs> and going, at, going to work. And so I was doing little tests and making armatures and I made two, uh, two pieces that were Bear Run 1 and Bear Run 2. And Bear Run 2 is at the Limbrook Museum in Germany, Duisburg, Germany. And there's another one in uh, North Carolina, Kay. the Triangle, something Triangle. Um, and it was, I was just complete, I had my books on falling water and write, and it was just like this immersion but basically it was really all about me and my sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to, to give it everything that I could give it. You yeah. know, the, the mark making is I would, pour, I would pour plaster in a sling and with my hands just kind of make this flow and then go back and tilt it up with my assistant, and then go at it with an as, which is like a curved kind of chisel tool, like a hatchet. And to me, it was my Cezanne brush strokes. Huh. It was like every, every mark was uh, reflecting light, 
and how to make an edge that would reflect the light of this abstract concept of water falling and figuratively in, in, in nature. So what, talk a little bit more too about how nature's inspired your, your work. I know you, yeah. you live on in Long Island now where you're you're on a on a pond and only a mile from the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, you've surfed, you've been coastal both in I, I New York and Los Angeles and in Florida. I, I how guess have you, yeah, I have you brought that into your work? It's more um, I wanted to work with nature and nature would be the way I would address sculpture yeah. or painting or drawing. And, but my work deals with also gravity. I made these airship pieces that are super lightweight and they're kind of floating above the viewer. And that has always kind of sustained a, that imagination that I like to give to the work. I want to kind of exchange, um, in a way, the yeah. form and the thoughts. And so nature, water, I've done big pieces uh, where I'm just working in clay and like de Kooning. The de Kooning clam diggers <coughs> are miracles. They are, I never realized if you've ever seen these sculptures that what you're looking at is the reflection of a figure, a, a clam digger in that thin veil of water. You're, you're looking at the reflection and that's why they're uh -huh. all over the place and that's why he has that latitude to uh, make those marks and they just seem so wow um, I didn't get it until somebody was in, enlightened me the, about the clam digger yeah just kind of squint and turn your head upside <laughs> down <laughs> but um, I don't know where did I deal with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bringing nature into your work. Oh, okay. yeah. Nature. Yeah. So, well, I mean, yes. you're, and you're on Long Island where there's a great history well, de Kooning, yes, Jackson de Pollock. Yes, de Kooning. Pollock was down the road and yeah. all of them, I mean, that was one, coming from California, I thought, what is this Long Island? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, they don't have beaches like we, or, but when I got out to Long Island, Linda Banglis, a sculptor, a uh, friend from, she was exchanging New York, California at the same time. There were a lot of us that were doing this. Bi-coastal thing. Bi-coastal, mm -hmm. free flowing, just somehow supporting ourselves. Um, but yeah, so the nature out there is, if you haven't been, it's glorious. It's a little, crowded, a lot of weirdos. <laughs> uh, you don't want to be there in August. Um, but it's really miraculous. So we were talking about there's now that they've cleaned up the water and then the, the Hudson and the bunker are streams, rivers of bunker. There are now humpback whales just right offshore doing these breaches. And we're uh, at the beach just going. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a celebration. So uh, basically I decided to go the way of nature and not do um, a social sure. or a message of sure. some other level. I wanted to be. So with these airships, so that you know, a bronze waterfall is very rooted and grounded and mm -hmm. you're doing these airships that are floating and cantilevered mm -hmm. from one point on the wall, are floating off the floor, just tethered to the floor. Yes. Are you, are you trying to balance something with your art by doing 
floating form and grounded Probably. form? Probably. Yeah. I might be afraid of it all. <laughs> of who are these two people that are making these well, things? Well, you're a Gemini, I learned. I'm a Gemini. Yeah. He's a Gemini I'm a Gemini. Also. Yeah. <laughs> we have Gemini. to create balance in our and lives. And I go back and forth. Well, first of all, working with NASA, it was all about orbital. It was all about um, the view from above. Mm -hmm. And that's how the, the lake idea and um, actually you can even in, in history, you can see where the camera was invented and then the, the balloon, and then all of a sudden there's a aerial view in the 18 something or maybe, yeah, 18 something. So that view from above was always so provocative that that's, you know, I kind of came from a gravity free astronauts floating in space and how can I celebrate that in a yeah. way? When you, you do extraterrestrial sculptures and things too, don't you? Like moonscape Moonscapes. sculptures and... I'd like to invite everybody here to my studio. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yes, I thought another progression. Yeah, if you're doing this, I've been doing it 50 years mm -hmm. now. It's like, at this point, it's how do I fulfill um, the here and now, but how do I uh, expand out and kind of bring my past and work with me as the information that I would take the next step? Yeah. Somehow that sounds confusing, but um, it was interesting when I was working at NASA, talking with engineers, everybody thought we were going to have space stations in 2000. They thought there'd be Hilton hotels <laughs> and, <laughs> and wait, you won't believe what there's in. It was like this kind of optimism yeah. uh, of humanity, of like the next step. And it was... Uh, I thought that the airships kind of just had that presence of lighter than be the incredible lightness of being, right? Yeah. Um, I'm now doing some, taking the dirigible, I was realizing that the I've given a spine to the dirigible. So no longer is the dirigible a rigid structure and a kind of a linear configuration it has a spine and then I was thinking well it's going to come all of a sudden I could do all these other forms just by doing this one thing of giving it the, the spine um, they call it fusi form fusi forms can be either worms pasta fish <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible word um, and maybe those whales that you and see the, at Long Island so now the yeah. whales are, are just structurally they're like a dirigible but they've got the spine and they they are these kind of to work with the idea of abstracting that to where you're I'm not conveying I'm not it's not about mimicry I'm not conveying like this is a whale or this is a porpoise. I just want that form to kind of come at you another way. Um, yeah. When your work's taking you internationally as well, and you found your way to Hydra at one point. Went to Hydra. And visited with Edgar Kaufman Jr. there. Yes. What was, what was the occasion for getting you to Hydra? Was there another? Well, I was pretty good friends with Bryce Marden and Helen Marden and they invited me to Hydra wonderful people one my f favorite artist almost Bryce um, he really hits it up there yeah I kind of reach for that level of sublimity and you know kind of to lock in with abstraction but it's calligraphy as well as dancing or mm -hmm. as nature. I mean, mm -hmm. it just gives you what you want to 
brain. Yeah. Um, and <coughs> Edgar had said that if you ever go to Hydra, and so I went over and knocked on the door, <laughs> and there they were, this glorious house in Hydra. Yeah, explain Hydra for, for the people that might not know much about the island. Uh, well, it's, it's easy to get to because it's very close to Piraeus, so that was one thing. You're not just off on this long commute, but a lot of Europeans, but intellectuals and artists and writers and musicians, you know, Leonard Cohen is there, and there's Bryce and Helen, and I mean, it was just this lively, wonderful place on uh, you know, and the cafes and the port and all the, the port activity. Um, and then there's Edgar <laughs> and Paul. <laughs> and they're in this, just this glorious space is, that was, uh, and we had this a wonderful lunch. And um, yeah, it's, I wish I had taken some photos of that place. Yeah. Because it was the whole experience of Hydra, from what I've heard, was like theater. I mean, yeah. there was procession, there was theatrics, there yes. was this great intellectual crowd of people that you're interacting with. And it's the culture, the Greek, the Greek culture, culture. And I mean, that's the, the best museum in the world is the uh, Acropolis Museum. Or, I mean, that was so inspirational to me, the, uh, the boy on the horse just that talk about gravity free like they're both flying um so for a sculptor going to greece is like going to mecca yeah in a way i mean you see the basics um and it's very inspiring yeah yeah so how many times have you been to falling water was this just your second trip this back or the third third trip Fourth trip. Fourth trip. Yeah. yeah. I drove through here once. I've been here in autumn, which we all know how great autumn is here. <laughs> um, and I uh, came here in the spring and driving through. So I didn't get the, the tour today. Thank you. That was <laughs> my God. Every consideration, every decision is just a not only gutsy, but poetic, you know, way to experience the space and... Uh, and you were telling me earlier that you stole yes. the idea from the fireplace. I, well, I think Frank... Frank stole, stole Frank, it from you. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he, he stole, stole the it, idea. Yeah, he yeah. stole it from probably old England. Oh, yes. But... Early American. I did put this element in, I have a place in Tribeca and I worked with an architect and renovated, re renovated this space and designed a fireplace that was just right out of this. I want something right. that I can swing in and cook and swing out and eat. <laughs> and uh, yes, it was uh, so. That so after being back, favorite thing about falling water? Wow, that's Showing Lucy. Aw. <laughs> and that this is your first time. And having that conversation, it's just like every year, it's just the information, it's not like um, hard edge or, you know, it's not academic. It's just like this, these solutions are a celebration of idea they're like wonderment how you would do all of this um, it's pretty darn good I mean this place is <laughs> spectacular <laughs> really least, least favorite thing about falling water least favorite thing <laughs> it's got to be something you don't like about it um, is this a uh, the rhododendrons are covering my view sculpture. of the sculpture. <laughs> That hemlock tree's well, grown a little bit too tall. The hemlock tree got big in 30 years. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Nothing much. <laughs> um, who is your biggest? Do you have a 
main person that's inspired you throughout your career or a handful of people that have really mm. directed where you've gone with your work? I kind of just like to scan, scan Matisse sculptures, scan Giacometti. Um, in literature, it was interesting because Borges would do an overview and mythological-wise things, and I thought that would be an interesting way to conceptualize of my work yeah. is to have a an otherness about what it is you're looking at, um, and um, Giacometti. Brancusi is kind of obvious, mm -hmm. but I will go back to him any day. Yeah. Um, some of my friends, Susan Rothenberg was a really good friend and a great painter, but Eric Fischel and David Sally, we all hang out together and have wonderful dinners and yeah. beach time. and. Do you still surf? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, for aspiring sculptors and fine artists, do you have any advice? Um, to uh, just to go out and experience everything, every curiosity, and kind of pack it in as um, strength, and it takes takes a lot of strength yeah. to do what we do because it's uh, it gets lonely hmm. in what way well you i mean you know you're hard on yourself mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. i mean you're you're a tough critic mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes you just have to i mean when i look at this I, you know that Wright was kind of wondering is this too much is did I he ever question himself <laughs> let's go <get I> <laughs> i'm sure he did yeah 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 even the way yeah. that window opens into the desk and you just yeah. go all right that's a s what a solution what a solution yeah. he was yeah he's kind of like monumental but that's why some of these archit architects and artists are who they are they go to that they level persevere yeah yeah well, I'd like to open up questions from the audience Can I to engage. Something? Absolutely, Alex. I mean, I've been coming here since I was eight years old. And I've been here for dinners, I've been here for parties, but I've never been here for something like this. And I really want to thank Justin. Oh, well, thanks, Alex. Because so. it's, I mean, I have a picture of my grandfather talking with Edgar to Einstein, and so, <laughs> wow. but, but I was too young at those days, mm -hmm. and I just really appreciate this, and I appreciate you, this is completely your idea. Oh, well, thanks, Alex. He is great, I must say. And, and your questions were excellent. Oh, well, thanks, Alex. Yes. No, no, sorry, I just... No, <laughs> I, I thank you. <laughs> well, and, you know, spending time here as a child, I mean, this place has shaped shaped who you are. There's no question about it. Absolutely. And my family also. And your family too. Yeah. And clearly shaped your career and your mm -hmm. trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, you never said so. what Edgar said when you showed him the sculpture for the first time. Ah, yeah, great question. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> what else would he say? Uh, well done. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> No, but uh, I mean... I mean, he had a choice, too. He had yeah. the number one or the number two. The number two was more of a, a... The fall is coming from a canyon, so it's a concavity. And then it comes to a, a certain point and then gathers and then drops. And this one was, was more... He liked that it's just... It's almost like two sources coming to this point on the edge of a crevasse or whatever, or here. If you see what's so amazing about this place is that you can see water, that elastic moment between mm. 
moving horizontal and falling. There's this little, and I'm sure Einstein was just kind of wondering what that elasticity is. Um, That's fascinating, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they say that Calder, uh, Calder had a show at uh, MoMA and he had his, there's this thing called the time and something equation. It was like this crazy sculpture that measured time. And Calder was like an part engineer, part, I mean, he was, he's one of my tops too, because he had some joy in his things. Um, and they say that they close, uh, Einstein came and went in and sat for like two hours watching every little mechanical because it was all about movement and time and space and it, it wow. was like Einstein loved it so <laughs> that's, that says enough <laughs> well I have to think that's a pretty important spot at Falling Water it's the first impression of the house of the architecture of the stream of the waterfall yeah all kind of culminating at that spot so he must have had great confidence in, in you and loved the work. It is incredible that he had that confidence because he just walked right in and pulled out the picture. I mean, there was no ass assuming anything. It was just, I saw your work, Guggenheim, this is what I've got, and it was a boom. Uh. So I have a question too. To be given that opportunity is quite, you know, that's something. But then to have to work in the shadow of this, yeah. Mm -hmm. was, I mean, just mentally, how how did you separate? Because you had to separate yourself from it at some point. Mm -hmm. It would just be, it would just start overpowering mm -hmm. your own work. So, mm -hmm. what was that power? Of, like, how did that? moment of separation happened for you? Being a little naive. Um, How old were you at that time when you got this commission? And this was your first private commission, right? Your first, first, commission. first commission. Yeah, oh, your first commission. <laughs> yeah. I've had some pretty good commissions, but this is the first and best. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, to me, the, the falling water stands completely high on the tower of greatness. And I was thinking more of, like I was saying, it, it's quiet. I'm, I, want, I wanted my work to be quiet because it, you can have a meditation the way you can isolate things here or details here that I didn't really feel like I was competing, thank God. Yeah. I mean, there was no reason to kind of take on Frank Lloyd Wright when you see, you know, this place. Not but like Christo either, right? I mean, it's, yeah, <laughs> right. I'll take on Christo. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it was, wasn't as daunting as you would think. I was just in the flow. It's, Sam has so, so I wanted to ask a couple of things. What year was it actually made? And then if you talk about how it was made, and mm -hmm. you said you had models, but were they actually used? Did you use the one model to cast from, and how was it cast? Um, and lastly, like, what were you thinking about in terms of scale? Because it's such a pivotal spot on a bridge, mm -hmm. and yeah. then obviously with the house. So what were you think? I'm sorry to ask you about many questions. Well, the scale is, I actually my studio out in California in Venice had 26 foot ceilings, so I wasn't really you know worried too much about worried it. there, but I didn't want it to be something that's just kind of overstated. Mm -hmm. Then that's saying too much of itself. It's, I want it to be, like I was saying, like quiet and meditative and you happen upon instead of it coming out and grabbing you like mm -hmm. 
uh, two plates of steel, <laughs> two big plates of steel. Um, and I made the originals in plaster and back and forth, um, working on them vertically and then lying them down and pour doing another pour. And I was working on both of them and then I cast them in a foundry in California. And uh, that's that old, oldest technique in the world uh, from China on. Um, that's why I like that first bronze I made was the Wall of China. So that kind of, all these things kind of connect. Mm -hmm. like that works, mm -hmm. this works. What year was that? S the Wall of China was 75. The, this piece was, I think I made it in 78. It was am amazing how, m I not only that was happening, I was in, um, oh, the Venice Biennale. It was somehow the stars just kind of all got into alignment and Edgar Kaufman calls me up. <laughs> And opportunities were presenting themselves, and I was in the flow. Wow. Mm. You had a question. How long did it actually take from beginning to end? When he walked in the door, it was a shift. Did he give you a deadline? Yeah. He didn't give me a deadline. I, I did that pretty quick. It was all within months. It was like fresh in my mind. I can't went out there. I had a mission um, and a, a commission. It was so exciting. Um, and so the whole thing was within a, a year of making it, coming out, doing the measurements, doing the drawings for a footing, installing the, the piece. Edgar was here for that. And we had a a good time and uh, a uh, little bit of a celebration. Um, and did you smash a bottle of champagne on it? On right you? on it. You did can you see <laughs> the dent? How how is it rooted into the ground? Is it well? It's a deep it footing. Okay. And yeah, we don't want what happened to the right, marini. To the marini yeah. um, and it's a male female okay. kind of thing. You can. Uh, see in the, well, the old Whitney or in the Guggenheim, they're going, like, oh, you're not going to drill in the floor, are you? And I'm going like, <laughs> <laughs> I will repair your floor, I promise. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, actually. Um, hearing about how your, your work has evolved throughout your career is so interesting. And I was wondering, if you were to get the same commission now, at this point That's in your a good career, question. <laughs> what would it look like? Oh my God. Do you wow. think it would look yeah. the same? That's a good question. I'm running with it. Um, <laughs> I, well, I think I would bring my experience, my 45 or 50 years experience into a more, I don't know, I, I think I would just give it more in the mark making. Mm. Mm. Um, maybe have, I, I really don't know how I do it. I don't think I would kind of go out. I would want it to stay because it, after all, is what I wanted was this meditation and quietness more than, hey, look, I'm a sculpture um, and sometimes that's some of the best sculpture you'll encounter is hmm. you know like a Rousseau uh, or even say Giacometti or something um, yeah I would probably bring more guts into it more angst and more of my kind of uh, well, I love what you just said because when you round the corner you have that aha moment that you're seeing this amazing place but then once you get to the bridge that idea of a meditative state you kind of just release mm -hmm. start to relax and then let the house and the experience mm -hmm. take over 
That's nice. And I love that you that subtlety, the meditativeness of your work mm -hmm. sets the perfect tone for the start of the experience here. Thank so, you. Yeah. Mm. Fascinating story. Any any other questions? No. Bravo. Oh, we go to the studio next week. We get to go back to the city for the one hot dinner. Dinner. <laughs> dinner. Of course. <laughs> If we wanted to see your work now, where would we go? Uh, right now, it would be um, where? Well, I have a piece at the Jewish Museum in New York, and I have a piece at the Morgan Library. Oh, fantastic. Um, little drawings, uh, and the piece at the Morgan, uh, at the Jewish Museum, is was a the Barnett Newm Barnett and Annalee Newman foundation and they purchased my work and that's the scope that's actually made the same around the same time as this um, my studio is out on Long Island and converted old 18th century barns and well there's 19th century barns 19th century barns and um, we have an old potato Lucy's a painter and we have um, a potato barn that's not we're leasing from a farm family who are wonderful um, yes a piece on view at Lachma too LA County Museum has a piece of the, an airship right now floating it's another kind of discovery you know it's like you're walking and then all of a sudden oh <laughs> <laughs> there's something up there <laughs> Well, let's give Brian a round of applause. And a thank you for making this trip out from New York.